Hello everybody, I'm Matt Anderson. Welcome to The Road Not Taken, how ordinary people get out of their own way and you can too. I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Derek Dryden, who uh, is uh, based in Yorkshire in the UK. So uh, Derek, Derek, just a few words if you could share to those listening, just to give a little bit of background about yourself. Okay, um, well I'm uh, originally from uh, South London and um, I emigrated to the north of England um, 20 four years ago and um, I've been uh, in the financial services industry profession I should say uh, since 1990. Um, I initially worked for um, lawyers in, in West End of London for the first 11 years of my life and yeah. um, just thoroughly enjoy what I do. Um, really um, the highlight for me of, of my uh, my job is uh, I just love adding value um, wherever possible for, for private clients. Yeah. No, it's funny. That's absolutely been identified with other people I've talked to about what's helped them be, be really successful in their line of work. So um, just to kick things off, and we'll, we'll kind of get into this in a little bit later. I mean, obviously, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to interview you is because you come from certainly more humble origins than many people in your line of work and in, certainly that have reached your level of professional success. That's the real reason we're talking. That said, you know, can you can you go back to sort of what prompted you to want to, I suppose, have a much bigger life, really? I mean, I can't just get out of your own way because I don't know if you, you know, you, most of us aren't aware we're in it sometimes, but what, what prompted you to want to have a much bigger and better life than the one you grew up in? Um, I suppose, well, Back in um, no, 1961, um, I said working class family, very much working class. My mum my was a cleaner, my dad was a driver. We lived in a, um, a very, um, a very hands to mouth existence. Um, my mum and dad no, no, divorced when I was really young. Um, my mum and my brother um, developed drinking problems. You no, know, became alcoholics. Um, so when I was growing up, didn't really have um, any really positive role models in terms of, um, I suppose, you know, trying to show me a, a better life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose you know, when you're in that sort of existence day to day, year to year, you almost, almost become to, to accept this is the norm. So um, it was really the, the hope that you know, there was something better. And um, I just wanted to give my chance, myself a chance to... Um, to explore um, you know, what the possibilities could be, you know, how I could improve myself, um, become a, a better version of me. So what's going through my head at the moment is wondering where that hope came from. In other words, if you think harder, were there, was, there, was, there, was there exposure to, to books or films or was there a teacher that kind of planted that seed? Because it sounds to me, or, or do you remember a time when that hope started to emerge or you became or you, when you became aware of it um i suppose it was it was more a case of that you no know, there were quite a lot of negative influences and it was almost a case of by elimination sort of discounting things that i i didn't want to um to be part of so you no know, a really silly example is that you no know, as far as I can remember, every member of my family smoked. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a really easy decision for me to say, no, I don't want to do that. Um, when I looked at the lifestyle of people around me, it was a case of, well, that doesn't really appeal to me. And, and it's all, by elimination, I almost found um, a path to, to doing what I wanted to do. But I suppose at the time, it's, this is all hindsight, because when you're living that life, as I said before, you just said, well, is this the norm? No, you, you see external influences and a lot of it, I suppose, is, is based on you know, how uh, TV and films um, glamorise things. But um, it was really a case of, well, I needed to find an alternative because I, I didn't want... When I looked at the lives of people around me, I just wanted more. But uh, trying to... Trying to identify the, the point where you know, that I identify that is it's really difficult. Yeah. It's funny and now there's two things that are on my in my mind. One of them is so I did a podcast interview yesterday with a chap who trains 
big companies. I mean, Microsoft has been one of his clients, and international pizza franchises. And one of the first things out of his mouth yesterday was how one of the biggest fears we have is is not fitting in. Mm. Um, and yet what I'm hearing from you is that you were very willing to not fit in and be the one who didn't smoke or didn't you know, turn to drink. That you use the expression, none of that stuff appealed. So, yeah. again, I'm, it's, well, yeah, and I, I appreciate what you're saying too, is that there wasn't this one moment when you realized it, but it must have been something you felt. Yeah, I, I suppose it was um, the, the day-to-day existence of um, the routine that we had as a, as a, as a family, um, in the loosest possible sense. Mm. Um, I suppose it was just a case of um, if if I had I had a, an older brother and a younger sister, and um, neither of those people um, were really sort of giving me any sort of insight in terms of you know, what what could be. So it was a case of you no know, looking around. You no, know, I had you know, obviously school friends whose whose lives were a lot less chaotic than mine. Mm-hmm. And I suppose it was just almost like baby steps, thinking, well, you know, how am I going to make this transition from you know, being surrounded by um, daily doses of chaos um, and you know, just trying to find better solutions elsewhere. So um, it was, I think it was a, a progression over a long period of time uh, more than anything. Okay, no, that makes sense. Um, so, um, in terms of drive for you, is that kind of how you would respond to that too? In other words, it was a kind of a building gradual progression as you started to discover that other people had different lives that didn't have to be the same as the one you were growing up in. And bit by bit by bit, you started to sort of started to open up your mind to what other things that were possible. Is that? Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's. Um no, there were there were certain events that no, in hindsight I can look back on and say yeah no that was quite key. So I suppose the first one for me was that I left home um, when I was eighteen. So um, left school, had an interview, got a job, left home straight away. Um, I think a couple of weeks in between getting a job, moving out, no tops, and uh, again that was really all about just trying to find. I suppose a more positive environment to to try and find something better. Um, and I suppose no, when you start working, um, your influence is widened. So no, you instead of being you no know, family and friends that you no know, you're trying to to get positive uh, role model, models from, mm-hmm. you then in the working environment and it just so and so whole new world. So again. Even back at that time, I didn't really know the journey I was going to go on. It was like baby steps in order to try and get to a better place. So that was that was certainly one of the first keys. Yeah, and it's funny because that theme of who you surround yourself with, I tell you, it comes up with just about every single person I talk to. And it, and it's funny because I, it, it's one of those pieces of advice that I used to just think was a fairly meaningless cliche and I, I'm clearly learning from this process how wrong I am about that and that it's it's in, I mean it's unbelievably significant that actually sounds like a crucial part of getting out of your own way but of living a bigger life is surrounding yourself with other people that are moving in the same direction or at least as you said you know just sort of opened up a whole new world can you can you talk about how you applied that or you applied it then and then Obviously, you didn't because you didn't stay put either. It's not as if that was good enough for you to just get a you know a steady job and settle down. But you obviously continued on that path. But how have other who you've surrounded? Can you talk about like how who, how who you've surrounded yourself with has has helped you has helped bring you up, but also yeah, giving you new opportunities. I suppose the um, one of the things I really struggled with um, in, in my young younger years was that. Uh, because my, my mum and dad really didn't, I suppose, I come from a, a strong educational you know, mantra. Um, I didn't do particularly well at schools, but when I started to work, um, it was it was really impressed upon me that um, education, you know, in many different levels, was the way to, to 
self improvement really. So uh, even my first job um, working in the the finance department for uh, London solicitors, it was all about okay, well we need to start getting you on you know, bookkeeping courses, accounting courses. So I quite willingly you know, went to evening classes for you know, I can remember the first three years of my job, and and, and that continued really into my my second job as well, um, started doing accountancy courses, um, evening classes two nights a week. So it wasn't that um, I was sort of shying away from the educational side, but it was just I was now being shown a path. And um, and it was something that, you know, if I could see that the benefits were going to be there, it was, it was something that I was more than willing to, uh, to drag myself along. So what's your take on education then? Yeah, it's, um, it's one, one of the things I love about social media is it's full of very, very cheesy stuff. And um, but the irony is, it's all true. No, it is all true. So, I mean, knowledge is power. Um, and so the more obviously, you know, you can tailor it to, to your own circumstances, your own goals, your own objectives. Um, but yeah, no, I think. Education is absolutely key in, in improving improving um, the, yourself, really. And then, and then, but presumably, obviously, it's not it's, it's putting into action what you learn as, as well. Though, yeah, right? yeah, right. yeah. So, so, talk about how you've done that. I mean, maybe keeping it simple, or easier, just from a memory standpoint, to have the success you've had as a as an independent financial advisor. How do you take things that you learn and put them into practice? I mean, can you give us a couple of examples of that? Um, I suppose the um, one of the things that social media does is it's uh, an endless supply of new ideas, just, no, just different perceptions of uh, a lot of positive um, thoughts, if you like. So I suppose one of the things that I love to do when I have my client meetings is it's all about education for me and just a lot of time because clients these days they have more access to information than they've ever had before um, and I suppose the challenge that financial advisors have is just being able to um, take those client perceptions and just turn them or show them how they're relative to to their situation from a financial point of view, but also in terms of you know, just the way they think about money and, and and what the whole point of financial planning is. One of the things that's coming across to me is your genuine uh, well, love, really, of, of education. But it's like, what's funny too is when I think about all the, the sales books I've been to and the workshops and so on that are full of techniques and strategies and tips about how to sell more, and yet... You know, you've had. I mean, you didn't mention this. You were modest in your introduction about the the, the accolades and the you know, the times um, that you've had from clients praising you. And what I'm feeling, you know, what I'm sensing from you is that that part of that is just your genuine, genuinely enjoying educating people on how to do the right thing for themselves, which is well, nothing to do with sales really. Um, no. Specifically, this is so. Therefore, I can see you actually again. The irony being is you having more success because people don't feel like you're trying to pull one over them or sell them something they don't necessarily need or pitch something that's, again, above what they really need, but in fact it's more yeah. just this genuine uh, enthusiasm you have for making sure that they feel empowered to make what the, you know, the best choices for themselves. Yeah. Um, and now it's fun, to, for me anyway, to sort of connect those dots back to what you didn't have as a child. Um, so, uh, you know, light bulbs are going off for me on this whole topic of learning because... Um, you know, I had more of a middle class upbringing, and so education was sort of a, taken for granted. Um, whereas what, what's recurring to me now is that and I, lo I, I love to learn, certainly, um, but I've always just sort of assumed it was something that was, again, that everybody had equal access to. But um, yeah, that was naive of me to be thinking along those lines. So, so the whole point that to, to getting out of your own way sometimes is learning more about what you need to learn and I suppose I would also go so far as to say because now I'm thinking about my own situation is this thing sometimes we don't, we don't, we don't think we're good at and need to learn if we're going to get better and that's another way we can get in our own way and because it's uncomfortable for us one of the things I want to, I want to come back to before or mostly before I forget but it's just around 
anything relevant that's also going to drive you from your upbringing in terms of pain, and, and without necessarily getting too unnecessarily personal, but what, what, one of the things on my mind is um, when I read Alan Sugar's autobiography, and what, what I, and in fact, it's, it's, well, it's not the only thing I remember in the book, but one of the things that jumps out at me, like still, in those years ago when I read his book, was he used the word hate, and he said he hated so much how lack of money was always one of the table topics at dinner. And that emotional pain of lack, um, you know, obviously seared him <laughs> such that, you know, his focus was so much around how can I make more and more money and never experience the pain that I had to grow up with and that my parents had. W was there anything like that for you that's helped on you? Because, again, you've come a long way, you know, in financial terms as well from where you started. Anything like that for you? Yeah, yeah, I can, um, e even though it's a Tottenham fan, um, and I'm an Arsenal <laughs> fan, uh, uh, I, I can, I can um, identify with a lot of that because, um, as I said, my upbringing was very much hands to mouth, um, week to week, month to month. Um, we, we, used to have things, we used to have gas and electric meters back in the day. Um, if you show 50 pence in the meter, um, there were lots of occasions where there were early nights because um, the electricity meter would run out and we would it'd be sat in darkness or sat with candles. So, um, but yeah, for me, and again, this, is, this has really pushed me throughout everything that I do now, um, money equals choice. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, when I think back to... Um, clothes or food or treats um it it wasn't necessarily all about you know having flash cars or great holidays whatever it was for us it was all always about the basics and i was very aware um in hindsight um that we it was a very very basic um upbringing that we didn't we didn't have a car didn't have a telephone um I didn't go abroad on holiday um, to us 23. Never had a holiday with my mum and dad. We used to have days out, you know, Brighton or South Ends. Um, so, again, this is all hindsight. So at the time, you thought, well, this is normal. Everybody does this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that hunger of um, being able to have more has, has always been a, a really strong driver. And then talk about, okay, so then you, 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 leave, you leave school and you start working for the solicitors. What, what, how come you didn't stay in a, you know, in other words, you had you know, this upbringing where you said we, we, you know, we just about had the basics most of the time. And I think, it's, I mean, that's even a stretch, but you know, but, but then you, you, know, you land a good, comfortable job. What, what, you know, isn't that, wouldn't that have been the, the mecca of where you wanted to be? And, and if so, what was it that, kept driving you to something different yeah that that is it's a really it's, it was a straight, really strange moment because uh, I just remember in 1990 um, my um, wife at the time she was expecting our our first um, child Amy and um, had a, a really good good job I could do my job with my hands behind my back and eyes closed and I was just bored really was bored mm -hmm. and um, at the time I was a client of somebody um, within a, a direct sales financial services company and they just happened to mention to me that they were looking to recruit as I imagine lots of other companies were in financial services in 1990 um, I went along and absolutely hooked by the the thought of um, being able to control my own earnings, really, because weirdly, this this was a commission only job, and um, so as well as having a pregnant wife, mortgage, um, cushy job, decent earnings, was changing that world for the uncertainty of uh, commission only. So um, it was just the the whole vision and, and belief that yeah I could I could do this is something I could really be good at. And forgive me for asking this, but well, where did that belief come from? Because that's a huge risk that I would say many people never take in their entire lives. 
and you pick them up. Yeah. One of the most scariest times of all to do it with a pregnant wife, and you've never been yeah. in sales before. You've never been in sales before. No, no, no never. Um, and um, that's what I mean. I mean, I can imagine there were lots of scenarios where people would make that sort of move, um, almost out of, um, I don't know, different emotions, desperation, the need to, you know, financially find a best place. Um, but it's, it's a. Re- I've thought about it lots and lots of times in terms of, you know, what it was, and I, I just think it was. I was just really sold on the dream of, no, I can do all this good, um, no, helping people, but at the back of my mind, it was always the case, I can do all of this, and I, I can be really well paid for doing it, so, no, what, I couldn't really see the downside, and um, it was it was a massive leap of faith, and um, it's, in hindsight, you no, know, one of the best things I've ever done, although, of course, commission only, being the animal that it is, you know, good signs and bad signs. So, um, and again, all character building. And you weren't afraid to make a change. I mean, is that a theme too that you feel like you've had at all throughout your life? Yeah, I think, um, and again, when I when I think back, and again, the when 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 I analyse it. I think back, no, my and mum's attitude was always, um, no, when we didn't have any money, didn't have any food, or it was always a case of, no, something will turn up. No, just this instinctive survival technique. So I, I was, now and still today, a very, very open-minded person. And, um, and I suppose, no, being open-minded makes me very... Um, easy to sell to. You know, I, if somebody can say to me, "Look, the, the, the classic line of if I can show you a way," mm-hmm. um, I'm I'm all ears and think, "No, no, show me." And um, I suppose you know, that's a really extreme example of uh, just being open-minded to to new ideas and and um, you no, know, just a really good decision in hindsight. Right. It, uh, another word that pops into my head is is purpose. Uh, you know, it sounds like yours is very much tied around educating others. But you made the comment even back when you were in your late twenties. You know that getting into financial services was an opportunity to do all this good. So you know, it must have had a connection to you even then that this is something that would really help people. Can we talk a bit more about that and how that's driven you? I suppose um, when when I became a client. Um, of this company, it was the first time anybody had ever spoken to me, or the the thought that even entered my head about financial planning, Um, and I just think, no, it's such a a compelling story about, no, this is where you are, this is where you want to get to, this is how we're going to facilitate that, so I just... I suppose I just fell in love with the idea of being somebody who can help somebody grow, you know, from a blank sheet of paper, you can, over a long period of time, you can really help somebody develop something worthwhile, meaningful, mm-hmm. um, and that you were the creator of that, you were the one who were, were introducing ideas and, um, and systems and processes, um, so I, it's a little bit chicken and egg really, in terms of whether or not it was the idea of, of being able to no, make a difference in people's lives, mm-hmm. or no, the write your own salary thing, which no, which was the, the stronger driver. Sure. Now I'm about to say something that I probably shouldn't, but I'm just. I, so I mean, I've coached. I, I can't. Even, I'm sure I've coached a thousand people or more in the last whatever, it's been seventeen years. At least eighty percent of these the people I'm talking about are financial advisors. Mm. Derek, I've, I've never heard anybody say, talk about how they have fell in love with being somebody who can help somebody grow, like to talk about the joy of the process. <laughs> um, in, in, no, one has, no one has ever said that. Um, wow. So, um, again, like I said, I probably shouldn't be saying that because I, I imagine quite a lot of people that will, will hear this are, are in the wealth management world. Um, 
and admittedly, you did also say that certainly the the, the, uh, the appeal of being in control of, of earn, you know what you can earn and not having a ceiling on your income is was certainly extremely attractive too. But yeah. your, your infectious um, love of, of kind of genuinely wanting to help people and guide them and educate them is you know is unusual. Well, it's unusually strong, and that's an understatement. I'm, I'm really, um, so, but one of the things I'm curious about is, I mean, given where you started in life, how did you deal with feeling like a bit of an imposter? In other words, giving people wealth advice when you, you know, grown up in such, you know, a humble place. I suppose it's um, it's sort of it's a really good reality check that you, know, you can you can use that benchmark as as a as a way of saying, well, no, this is this is one dimension. And, um, and it, it, I suppose it just makes it easier to sort of sell the dream of you know, improvement, you know, where, where, whatever that improvement be, whether it's improvement of mm-hmm. education, opportunity, financial security, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is. It's, um, and I, I suppose if I think about it the other way, if, if I had come from um, – um, the other end of the spectrum, where you no know, money was no object, you no know, nice, comfortable, secure family home, you no, know, I would, I would just be guessing. You no, know, this is this is how the other half lives. So, I suppose I'd much rather make the journey from where I started, hopefully upwards, yeah. than the other way around. Well, and it makes so, total sense too. So, I, I mean, what really, I'm, I mean, the, the insight I get, that I think anyone listening to this can get, is that regardless of what you're doing for a living or what your situation is, is first off, look at the, I suppose, the, the cool and exciting opportunity behind this rather than all the things that could go wrong. And and part of and, and what you say is it makes it easier to sell the dream of improvement. And that's absolutely true. I mean, whenever I'm considering a course or even looking at a book, I want to know how credible the, the person organizing it or the person writing it is. In other words, and, and they've always, it's one of the reasons I always admired Brian Tracy so much. And of course, I'm dating myself now, I'm assuming you're familiar with him, but, um, but many people aren't now because he's, he's, he's in his later years, but what impressed me about him was he truly started from absolutely nothing, um, and it was a complete rags to riches story, yeah. and there was no, there was nothing hidden about it, and I like, you know, that's why I was so impressed with him, is he wasn't born with any kind of rem- a remote kind of silver spoon at all. Um, he had a terrible upbringing, or yeah, miserable, but happy one. Um, and uh, and so you know, so it's, in, it's I, anyway. It, I'm really just trying to endorse the, the the mindset piece. Really, I think it's half the time when we have a challenge, it's how we're looking at it. That's, that, that, that's a big part of the problem, rather than you know, although that slows us down dramatically. And until we kind of shift how we're looking at something, we really can't do too much about it. And I think I think the big hurdle for many people. I'm not, it's, it's almost, I suppose, I don't know if it's just taking the time, or maybe we, we all need a little bit of help on that sometimes to to get some help to be able to look at things in a, in a different way so that we start to think about it differently. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. Um, so, um, so, so that hasn't been an obstacle. So, what, um, what have been obstacles for you then that you've had to overcome? Um, I suppose the one of the things that I find in financial services is that you, you tend to, to get two distinct groups of people. So, you know, you, you either get people who are really, really good technically uh, or they're really, really good at sales. It's, it's unusual to find someone who's good at both. And, no, yeah. they do exist, but they're, they're quite rare creatures. Um, and... Um, I suppose everything I've achieved in terms of qualifications that that's been a huge struggle. Um, there have been a couple of exams over the years where um, uh, there's been a, a couple of retakes, should we say? Yeah. Um, so trying to improve myself from a an educational point of view has been my biggest challenge. And obviously, financial services there are there are lots of those kind of hoops that, that you need to jump through, especially with uh, you know, the, the goal post changing on a regular basis. So, um, but I suppose everything else really has just been about just trying to surround myself with like-minded people and um, I suppose, you know, having 
the, the right mentor that can push you in the right direction. So uh, it's it's just been a progressive journey and um, just, you know, sometimes it is the case of being in the right place at the right time, but um, it, it's just strange how things... The, was it Gary Clay who came out with uh, the more the more he practices, the, uh, the better his fortune? So, um, yeah. no, there's something definitely in that. So when it comes to exams that you found challenging, yeah. talk us through your... You know, your how you strategize or how you overcome that? Um, I think the one of the mantras that um, no, I I really believe in is if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. So um, whenever I've fallen short in, a, in a, an exam, it's just really about being about no, just not repeating the same mistakes. So whether it's just studying a different way. Getting different influences, going on courses. Um, I suppose nowadays there's so many different ways where you can get so much more support. Um, and it just took me a little while to to find these these alternatives. Mm -hmm. So um, I just knew that, you know, left to my own devices of of you know, working full time, studying, you know, at, at opportune moments, it just wasn't going to work. It was. Going to be something that I needed to to make time for and 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 have plans. So uh, it was just having a, a, a better strategy, I suppose. Yeah. Well, although in, interesting, you broke that better strategy down into some real specifics too. <clears throat> like you said, studying differently, finding new courses that can help you, you know, master the content better. Maybe find other people that can help you in different ways or help you better, and then also just actually because making the time, which of course means giving yeah. time enough to, to make the time. So it's you know, I mean, it's not obviously so simple clearly because otherwise everyone would be doing it. I'm curious also, you said something about surrounding yourself with like minded people. So talk about that a little bit. In other words, can you give an example or two of how you kind of deliberately done that? Because, and again, what I'm really interested in for people listening is. You know, sometimes we hear a suggestion and then the next question we say to ourselves is, well, how am I going to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I suppose, again, that's one of the great things about you know, social media is that you know, you've got lots of people from different areas and um, I'm always trying to find ways of applying their um, experiences or their advice into financial services. But I suppose you know, within the company uh, that I work, um, we have people who we have a similar outlook in terms of you know, the whole point of financial planning and and how it should be delivered. And um, because we all have our own influences, I just find it really, really interesting sort of spending time with people and, and sharing ideas and knowledge and you know, books mm -hmm. um, like this. And, um, and again, you know, and clients as well. I mean, clients... I know a lot of the time when you're talking to clients, it can be a very tunnel vision conversation, but you know, especially retired clients, they've got so much um, knowledge and information and experience that it's, it's almost criminal that we, you know, we don't tap into that more. So I suppose you know, my influences come from a, a broad section of uh, people. And then from a business standpoint, can you talk about that a little bit more? I mean, in other words, people that do... Do you seek out introducers, center, what other people might call centers of influence that can refer you business, or where do you, I mean, are there literally physical places you've gone to meet like minded people? In other words, have you joined any groups, organizations, or anything along those lines? Yeah, I, I suppose the um, referrals is, is, a, is a big part of what I do. Um, I look after private clients, I don't, I don't look after uh, businesses. Um, it's just a decision I made very really early on that I just want I just want to help individuals rather than, than companies. So, and I suppose you know, back in the day, networking, all of that sort of stuff, I used to do an awful lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose what I found was that in my part of the world, um, you could very easily spend. Uh, put a lot of time and effort into those kind of areas and, and there'd be very little reward. So it was just really about you know, trying to, to work in a smarter way. So um, 
I do talk a lot with with introducers, but the number of people that I work with on on that basis are, are very very few because to me it's all about quality rather than quantity, mm-hmm. and um, I think you no know, that that applies to so many areas of, of what I do. Um, I suppose my my influences I suppose are more internal. I mean, we, we've got some really good people here, and um, and I suppose you know, when you see somebody doing something really, really well or being successful, I just want to find out, you know, what are you doing? You know, who are you speaking to? Where do you get that idea from? Um, so, again, it just goes back to this thing about being open-minded and receptive to change. And does that tie into the comment you made about mentors? Because I'm curious about that too. You said, oh, sometimes I'd find the right mentor. So, can you, where, again, where have you found mentors? Um, my... Um, so I've been with uh, my current company for 20 years now, and uh, and you know, the first the first sort of eight ten years or so were were okay. You no, know, I wasn't shooting any lights out. I was just head down, working what I thought was was really really hard, mm-hmm. uh, but the the success wasn't really um, showing itself in terms of the numbers. Um, and then um, I got a new boss, a uh, new MD at the company, and because he came from a very similar background to me, um, there were just so many synergies in terms of his progression, mm. and he just lit a fire beneath me. And so it's almost like a wind-up clock. He knows where all my buttons are. Mm-hmm. He knows how to get the best out of me. And it's just been a really, really positive influence um, on my career. What are one or two of the most useful things he's done to help light the fire? Um, I suppose it's it's about you know, listening is, is is so important. And again, you would think as financial advisors, listening is you know, one of the really basic but essential skills that you all need. But if we're the first person... Um, here to, to actually listen to, I suppose, you know, find out, it's almost like doing a fact find on me, you know, finding out about what made me tick, and you know, once you've done all of that, it was, you know, I suppose you just found it really, really easy to say, okay, well, these are your drivers, um, let's just align things in such a way as to, to, to get the most out of you, and, um, and I suppose, you know, he, on the one hand, he appreciates the qualities I have, but he also understands what my weaknesses are. So I think he's got the best of both worlds in, t- in terms of making me a, a better version of me, but also um, making sure that you know, we tip all the boxes in terms of you know, making sure that the things that were important to me you know, were um, delivered. That's interesting. So again, now please correct me if I you know, get this completely wrong, but it, it sounds like what he helped do was help you understand better your strengths and weaknesses and what motivates you. Is that accurate or did you already know most of those things and somehow you weren't leveraging them better? Yeah, I suppose no, the, the, the pattern here is a lot of this is no, it's, it's hindsight. You, it's only once you've lived it and you look back and you think, yeah, no, that does make sense now. But um, I suppose, no, I always... I always thought I knew, yeah, I know what I'm doing, I know how I'm going to get there. Um, the reality was that um, I could only control certain things. I didn't really have um, the the years of the people who were really going to have the influence to, to make the changes that I needed to make. So um, having somebody sort of empower you to say, listen, no, you can do whatever you want. No, I can show you how to do it, but then you've got to, You've got to do it. So it was. It was almost somebody gave me that focus and, and showed me, you know, the how, and uh, said, "Wound me up, set me off, and and off I went." And um, I suppose because not only do I like, I, I love praise. Um, I like um, proving people wrong. So you know, when somebody says to me, "Oh, you're not going to be able to do that." No, and he knew that. He knew when he would say, "Oh, somebody's um, 
somebody had a better month than you and looks like they're going to have another better month than you. It was, it was all the uh, motivation I needed. And I, I've got to dig a bit deep, deep because I'm just curious again from a practical standpoint. When you said he showed me the how, in other words, did you did you go so far as to sit down where he talked about this is how we want to structure the weeks differently, or you, you know you need to have two more meetings a week with prospects, or did it get into that sort of nitty gritty, or was it very much more around the heart and knowing how to hit those? Like you said, he he, he, he figured out which buttons to push to get you to work more effectively and I mean did you work harder as well do you think uh, but, um... yeah I, I suppose it was um, there were it was basically access awareness really there wasn't anything that um, that we didn't talk about no from um, diary you know, managing your diary um, managing clients looking at opportunities looking at what you're good at looking at what you're not very good at so it was really sort of laying yourself bare to say, look, this is how I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, how, how can I get better? And um, I suppose, you know, because of his experience, he, he was able to just, you know, really quickly just point out some really, really basic things in hindsight that, um, and, again, and again, showing me the way and then, I suppose, you know, giving me a, a glimpse of the rewards, mm -hmm. you no, know, from a personal and a financial viewpoint. You no, know, they were they were the sort of things that um, that just elevated me. And how often did you meet with him? Uh, he used to be in the office maybe three days a week, um, and it would just be little and often, you no, know, ten minutes, making a cup of tea, or and it would just be the I suppose you know, because of the ongoing reporting of you know, what you're doing, how you're doing, monitoring. Um, no, so it, it wasn't like you know, hour-long meetings on a daily basis. It was just really about um, just keeping tabs on on what's what's going on and um, and just making sure that um, you stand straight and narrow. Really, well, it's certainly bashing me over the head at the moment in a way about the whole notion of get a mentor more often because I do think it's one of the things that people that go big places are more open to doing they're, they're less they feel less somehow vulnerable to doing that they recognize the value of it and are willing to whatever risk looking badly or being vulnerable to those conversations in order to to, to make good progress did, did he help you you said he, I think you said he helped you better identify your weaknesses. So did that, did that kind of, is that where you recognised that, I don't know, sometimes the exam piece was slowing you down a little bit or were there other weaknesses that he helped you with? And the reason I'm asking that, that specifically, is not to be negative more just in terms of obstacles because, again, that's really what slows most of us down. But yeah. Was there another weakness area? Or was it diary management or was there something else there? Or the, the um, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, no, time management for me has always been um, an issue. Um, I've, I get easily distracted and still happens now every now and then. I sort of bring myself back and check, but because I get distracted by different things, I sort of start doing one thing and then think, okay, or get a phone call, get an email. Um, so managing my time has, has probably been the biggest thing. Uh, discipline that um, I've really had to sort of keep a tight rein on um, but um, I suppose no ultimately the 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 whole finding a better way you know just 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 trying to find more efficient ways of, of doing what the job that you need to do there are, there are so many plates you need to keep spinning um, it's just trying to find the the, the easiest it's route from um, to, to, to do all of that really. I'm glad you brought that up about the distracted piece because I think it's some, um, I don't know, I feel like I don't read about that much within, especially, well, it's probably, I think it's probably true within most sales professionals, but certainly my experience has been so much more within financial services too, and I've, and I've seen it a lot and I think it describes me as well. Um, but I think it's inevitable, well, it's, it's innate, as you said, in that for people to be particularly successful in financial services, they have to be good people. people have to be, they have to have some good, some good sales strengths. 
And I think that typically attracts people who are, yes, are the most detail orientated people on the planet. And, mm -hmm. um, and therefore, uh, for some reason, uh, I mean, the easiest way to think, I think it's very common. Anyway, but the question is, is, I mean, can you share a couple of, I suppose, strategies that you've used that have helped you be more effective with managing your time? Um, I suppose the, one of the things from my point of view is I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about how I'm going to add value to, to my clients. Um, so, you know, having communication on a regular basis is, is one of those. So we spent a lot of time sort of gathering um, contact details, to, sorry, contact details for clients, email addresses, that sort of stuff. Um, so as a result of doing that over a long period of time, clients now find it um, almost easier to send me an email rather than picking up the telephone. Um, so because that can become an easy distraction, uh, what I do is I close my email um, account um, and look at it at you know, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Um, and then that way, um, clients have, have realised that if they, if they need me urgently, telephone is the way. Um, and again, I suppose you know, the other thing that I, that I do, because I see clients on a regular basis, uh, a lot of the time with financial services, there are um, a few hoops you need to jump through, sort of pre-meeting, post-meeting. And some of these can be quite time-consuming as well. And uh, I just find it really important to stick to the discipline of just dealing with one thing at a time. So again, rather than, you know, if you have three meetings in the day, thinking, oh, well, I'll do that tomorrow, um, and then tomorrow comes along, you've got three more meetings, and before you know it, you've got a lot of file notes to sort of catch up on. So the discipline of just dealing with things in a timely manner really, really important. Mm, that's, those, are, those are really, I mean, it's funny, they, they don't sound sexy at all, but they're so, they're so significant, and it's funny, it's, I don't know if this is a relevant topic, but certainly not perhaps not to you, but certainly to people listening, I think one of the things I've run into a lot with people I've coached are people that I... I now, in my own mind anyway, I label it people pleasing, I should say excessive people pleasing. In other words, their inbox is open all the time, and any time an email pops in, they immediately address it regardless of how profitable that client is, and they end up getting nothing else done. They never work on the business. They're, they're, they're just, all they're doing is running around, and they think they're, being, they're, they're delivering great service, but in fact, they're actually running a very inefficient business, and they're, yeah, that was me. And they're impossible to coach because... <laughs> They, they can't get it out of their heads that the minute a client needs something, they have to drop everything no matter what, any time, any place. And, um, and it's, it, it's, it's really hard because it, it seems like it's coming from this honorable place of I'm here to serve my clients. And fortunately, it's a, it's a terribly ineffective, it doesn't work to build a business that way. So, so I'm glad you, you, know, you come up with a couple of extremely uh, specific you know, ways to, to handle that. I think, as you said, although you, again, probably immodestly threw out the word discipline on two or three occasions and that's that's everything that it takes is mm. shutting off the uh, the internet or what was it closing off the internet so that you don't get those distractions because otherwise it's it's a never thing you do um so anyway you were saying you, you you fell into that trap at some point too yeah yeah it's just um um there were so many um i said earlier about my clients now have more information than ever before well no it's the same for financial advisors you know you get bombarded with so many people who um who are effectively time thieves um you know, be it product providers or um financial services publications uh, and, and and some clients so um it really does need a, a plan of action to uh, to try and manage those those uh, time thieves I haven't actually ever heard that expression before. Um, it's a really good one. And um, I kind of want to jump back a little bit because now I'm sort of intrigued because now it's starting to sound like that your first eight to ten years in Yorkshire maybe it was just working hard on establishing yourself. But is it, it, it did that, did you kind of fall into a comfort zone there for a little while? Because you, so you took this big, huge leap to start working as independent, you know, independent, commission only professional. Um, can you kind of bring us up to speed on the story from there to Yorkshire in terms of, because um, now you're clearly at a point where you're 
you're definitely growing every year. So, so talk about what happened in between that time as far as you kind of continuing to take risks or embrace change or, you know, and have there been periods where you haven't? I suppose it's, um, I think one of the, one of the things that, that um, influenced me when I first joined Gain Philipson is um, my boss at the time sort of you know, used to make this big play of you no, know, it was the first time that I'd become a salaried advisor, and he would just say, "No, don't chase business. No, just don't, don't think of every bit of business. Every client is like really, really precious, and you no, know, just take a step back. And you no, know, perspective was was really, really key. And um, it took me a long time to really for that to sink in, where I would think, "Oh, I, I've just been." given an introduction, I've got to really pursue that to the ends of the earth and you know, get it to a conclusion. Um, and I suppose you know, part of that was about learning to, to value what you do um, uh, as a professional. So, um, and I think that's one of the things that's, that's really, really changed um, you know, definitely over the last five years. Um, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm now you know, really, really picky, but... Um, I just, I just love working with people who appreciate what I do, and um, and I suppose you know, that having the influences around me, where you know you can see um, examples of people doing really well, you no, know, it, it definitely helps. It's, you know, having positive influences is, is so important. And uh, there, were, as I said, there, there are so many different times when um, the social media we. You know, you're, you're seeing all these great ideas, all these um, different things that are working for people, and you're and I'm just constantly trying to find ways of cramming them into you know, the way that I do things because I, I just want to try and find ways that will will make me a better version of me, as I said before. I loved what you said earlier about how can you, you actually spend time on trying to think out how can I add value to my clients? <laughs> I mean, I, I hate to say this. But again, I can't think of too many people that have, have ever said that either. Um, right. I'm sure people do in their own way, but yeah. they actually make a point to sit down and set up that time to, to, to you know, deliberately, strategically think about it so that it's not sort of a fly by the seat of your pants type of thing or wing yeah. it. Can you, again, are there a couple of exam recent examples that come to mind about ideas you've had in terms of value that you, did, you know, that thought of to add to a client? Um, I suppose now, when when you think about, you know, said a couple of times now about how clients get information from turn on the news, they you know get in all of that negative stuff. Um, so you no, know, provide a perspective. You know, whether it is um, when you're having review meetings with clients and just sort of you know, just talking about you know, all the different things that are influencing their valuations. But I suppose one of the things that I um, get an awful lot of positive feedback from clients on is that um, because I now have a lot of their information in terms of you know, their, how to communicate with them so some clients they prefer the written word you know, through the post but a lot of clients now uh, are email so um, I, I send sort of regular updates on, on email addresses to clients but it's not it's not uh, Everything to everybody. It's very, very tailored so that you no, know, you you send stuff to the clients that are retired. You send stuff that is for the people that are, are heading towards retirement. Um, but a lot of it is is really you're just trying to make sure that it's newsworthy. So um, you know, when you're hearing stuff about Brexit or you know, what's going on with the US and China, and you know, you're seeing the stock market you know, being a little bit volatile, it's just sort of Providing a bit of perspective, and it can be just a few lines to say, "No, this is what we're doing. This is what our thinking is," um, and it's just that reassurance that clients want. Because left to their own devices, you know, if they just believe everything they read and hear in the news, you no, know, then um, it would it wouldn't be a, a really a, it wouldn't be a, a positive story, would it? Right. No. It's funny, actually, just last week I went to a book signing and there were two speakers and the other speaker that wasn't the one bringing out the book spent almost an hour 
talking about all the new technology that was being brought out in the energy world, which initially I didn't think I'd find interesting, but it was actually unbelievably fascinating because it's exactly what you just spoke of in the sense of the things that we don't hear about in the news, but yeah. the remarkable innovations that are going on, you know, that you don't even, that, well, not that you even just hear about, but you know, that you didn't even realize existed. Um, yeah. And, and just, again, all the remarkable positive things that are happening around the world, really, in terms of what people are doing with, I suppose, mm. technology. Mm. It was, um, for me, it was, it was a fascinating paradigm shift in terms of a different perspective on things, but it was also refreshing to see how many creative people there were and, frankly, how it seemed like most of the solutions to our problems were coming from people in business and, and in the science world, I suppose, you know, dealing with the uh, alternative energy. But it was, it was fascinating. It wasn't just around that energy. It was around, you know, um, real estate development and things along those lines. But anyway, the point being is it was that, you know, completely different I mean, uh, Yeah. Evidently not considered um, horrible enough to get on the news, or negative enough. Um, so anyway, <laughs> digress. So um, probably need to start wrapping up here. And um, so I think yeah. So I've got three final questions for you, Derek. The first one is, um, you know, who do, who do you think you've become since you started from your you know rocky childhood? Um, I think. Um from somewhere, um, I developed this um, very optimistic, open-minded, um, driven individual where um, every problem is is seen as a challenge rather than something that's, that's going to get the better of me. Um, and um, I suppose it's, it's just... It's just Positive mental attitude is isn't something that I I ever thought I would I would have you know, given the start that um, that I had. But um, it's just really really odd how you know, how I've evolved as a person. You know, having you know, started from where I did, um, having the, I suppose I've self motivated myself to, to to find out a better alternative. So. Um, you no, know, the, the 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 journey was always you know was something I was going to take, but I just never ever knew you know that I would end up here doing this. It's funny. I hadn't intended to ask another question, but I've just got to. So, one of the first thoughts that went through my head is is, is when you see your sister or when you used to see your brother when he was alive. I mean, I wonder if, if they felt like you were another species from another planet or something like that. But 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 my question is more around. You've clearly done remarkable, made remarkable changes to, as you said, to how you see the world, to your thinking. Yeah. What what kinds of things have you done to to, to keep that top of mind? Because it, it, I'm assuming it's not a, it's not inaccurate to say you weren't in your early years. You weren't born with this being modelled to you. So how and, and and we don't just magically become optimistic, open-minded, driven individuals. Where we see every problem as a, you know every problem as a challenge to to overcome. Yeah. What kinds of things have you done to keep to keep the top of mind? Because I think that's what it takes over years. Yeah. I suppose um, you know, my my mum died when she was fifty years old, and um, I was twenty one. And um, the it's not a day go by really when um, I don't um, regret or no miss. The fact that I never had an opportunity to share anything with her in terms of who I become, the people in my life, you know, my children, um, my successes, my failures. Um, and I suppose, you no, know, because I never forget what I came from, where I came from, um, there's, there's always, I'm forever sort of, you no. Know, looking back to, to those times and thinking, um, no, I, I just want to do better. Uh, I, no, I still, even though she's not here, um, no, I, I, I still want to make um, my mum proud. Yeah. No. Really, really silly, but... Well, thank you. Yeah, really. It makes me incredibly glad I asked you, really, because, again, there's... 
I think most of us need to take more time to, to go a bit deeper and think about those things and it would make us more likely to make more progress as well, I think, if we did, rather than perhaps numb it or repress it. Last couple of questions. So what would be a good first step for people listening? So the first step? To being, doing, having more in life, or you know, even just be a follow-up to what you just said. If people want to be more optimistic, open-minded, and driven, and have a healthy attitude to problems, I think first, the first thing for me, and again, and I've said a couple of times, you know, a lot of this is hindsight because you no, know, I didn't know that this was what I was doing at the time. But I suppose it's really difficult to put yourself in a or imagine yourself in a better place unless you surround yourself. No, you get yourself to a better environment. So whether it's um, who you're with, you know, what your environment looks like, um, you just need to surround yourself with people who have better answers. Um, and I suppose it is really important, though, if you can find somebody who can, I suppose, you know, show you a, a path, you know, just give you a route to say that if you do this and this and this and this, then you know, good things will happen. So I suppose ultimately all you're trying to do is give yourself a better chance of, of, of becoming something that you want. Um, um, so if you, if, you, if you stay where you are and you recognise that things aren't how you want them to be, then you, know, you shouldn't fear change. You know, it, Fear, look at change as being a, a potential positive because if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Yeah, that's fantastic, brilliant. And then, how can listeners keep in touch with you? Um, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. Um, I really love you know, hearing you know, so many thoughts and ideas from people about self improvement. No, just seeing stuff that other people are doing in different professions. Um, so if you go on LinkedIn, um, you'll, you'll see me put stuff on there most days, um, sharing ideas, sharing stuff that other people are doing that I really like. Um, and, um, and yeah, all my contact details are on there and I'm happy to talk to anybody. Okay, so if they, if they search the name Derek, D-E-R-E-K, driving D-I-Y-D-E-N, correct. Yeah, not your uh, or yeah. Very good, excellent. Well, thank you, thank you, Derek, so much. This has been um, a, a wealth of incredible wisdom, and I'm just going to wrap up here and uh, conclude things for people listening. So I always like to wrap up with a reminder to everyone you know, not to put the people you're listening to on a pedestal because you, know, you don't have to be perfect to make great progress and great strides, and it's sort of you know taking one piece and taking action on that and then building off that but it's an easy mistake to make is to just somehow assume that you're not the same as you don't have enough in common with the person you know, that, that, that you've been listening to or you'll never be as successful as them and that's it doesn't have to be that way and, and hopefully you know listening for to many people I'm interviewing you know, the whole purpose of this is to show that you know you can start wherever in life and, and still you know achieve remarkable things wrapping up otherwise thanks sincerely for listening today I, I'm positive you got some fantastic ideas today and in terms of show notes they'll be on the website matt-anderson.com matt-anderson.com otherwise if you haven't subscribed already please do please leave a review otherwise i'm going to wrap things up with my favorite question which is what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail i'm matt anderson and this was the road not taken thank you so much